right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last and final session of Discovering Impact in Today's World of Work. We are so honored to have you here. Um, this is our highlight of the session, our alumni panel. Um, today, they'll be talking about having impact in today's world. So I'm excited to share my screen with you for one moment as I bring up our special guests for today. Um, not that they need any introduction, but I will give it anyway. So first and foremost, we have Miss Sally Loftus. She is the Managing Director at Loftus Partners. Then Michael Fisher, our VP of Global Talent Management for Cisco Corporation. And lastly, Jessica Ekong, our Chief Human Resources Officer at Providence St. Joseph Health. So we are honored to have them here today. Um, they, their panel will be moderated by the one, the only, Dr. Gary Mangifico, our Academic Director of MSOD at Pepperdine Grazie Dio Business School. Um, so that's enough of me speaking. I'll go ahead, Gary, I'll turn it over to you. Um, thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much, Tiffany, and uh, really appreciate all of those of you who are, are with us, and especially if you've been staying with us through this whole conference experience today. We uh, have three great folks with us who are all MSOD uh, alums, which I'm very proud to say. Um, and we have a, a wide range of time zones. We've got uh, the certainly the Pacific, where I'm at, but we have Michael in the Midwest, so it's 8.15 in the evening for him. Sally in the East Coast, 9.15 in the evening for her. And Jessica happens to be uh, joining us today from London, and I think it is. So she's, it's like two something in the morning for her. So really appreciate their dedication and willingness to join us. So we wanted to do a couple of things. Let's kind of share, um, you know, a bit about what's going on in the world. And these are three very active practitioners in very different segments of business, but who have, uh, uh, who are certainly making an impact. And I think, as I indicated in the beginning of this thing this morning, that, you know, in the beginning of 2020, there was a lot of discussion going on at the time about the fourth industrial revolution, the emergence of the smart machine age, and then bam, we got hit with uh, uh, the COVID-19 virus and, and the assuming, um, you know, pandemic. And so, so much has changed and so many things are happening in the world is not just changing rapidly, but the practice of OD related uh, professionals is changing pretty radically. So with that, I just want to open it up um, and maybe I'll start uh, uh, with you, Jessica, um, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the world right now. We know you're the CHRO, but what does that mean? What, what are you finding yourself doing these days? Uh, well, I'll start with just addressing the fact that I wear three different hats. <clears throat> I wear a CHRO hat at Providence. Uh, as our educators of the MSD program told us we were responsible for the next generations. I also teach um, as an adjunct professor at Portland State University undergraduate HR courses. And then I also have my own consulting business. Hmm. Uh, at Providence during the day, I spend the bulk of my time uh, building talent strategies that help enable or accelerate business strategies for executives. Um, I'm also serving as a coach and advisor. And so that can be anything from focusing on design, talent management, or either or either coaching and developing talent. So that's a large part of what I do. Um, sometimes I'm just spending time giving people the words to say, if you will, to be impactful. Uh, and then from um, a coaching and consulting pers perspective, I'm spending a lot of time doing leadership development, but more so coaching for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So finding ways to meet people in a way that sometimes we can't in corporate spaces because of how training is designed. So being able to show up using the tools we've, I've learned in MSOD in an authentic way um, so that I can see more of a real-time impact. Great, thanks, Jessica. And um, you know, brought up the dynamic of, of uh, DE&I and, uh, on that, I'm going to switch over to Sally and ask Sally a very similar question of what's going on in the world. I know you're doing a lot of work in the area of social innovation. Um, so maybe you can share with us what that entails as an OD practitioner. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, I have my own human resources consulting firm 
which is really code for organization development. Um, I will say, you know, that's one thing I learned in the program is you lead in with a client with where they are. So uh, my background is in human resources, but I really work at the intersection of human resources, organization development and social justice. Mm. And so how that kind of that Venn diagram works is a couple of things. One is um, I work a lot around pay equity and pay justice. Um, and really going in and kind of doing like a whole body redesign um, with organizations on compensation with the justice loans. Um, and then um, also working um, with several organizations doing specifically diversity, equity, inclusion, consulting, whether it's from being a trainer to coaching to, you know, helping people build a strategy um, for the organization around DEI or maybe a strategic plan with a DEI lens. So um, kind of a wide range of things that I do in the world. Mm, great, thanks Sally, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Michael, you're in a more of a corporate environment and uh, serving uh, at Cisco there as the head of global talent and so forth. Um, how does your OD um, manifest in, in an executive role such as that. Yeah, it, it, and, and Cisco, this is the Cisco food, not the other one. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is one of those large companies that folks haven't heard of, about 70,000 people. And like almost all large organizations, maybe because of COVID or maybe uh, they're all doing it, but going through a significant transformation. So I find that a lot of what I'm doing in the world for Cisco right now is at, at both the or all of the individual team and enterprise level, it's transformation work around leadership capabilities. It's around organization design. And are we actually structured to have the kind of growth the company wants to have? What are, are the new mindsets that we really need to have? It's I really think the organization and maybe the world is at an inflection point. I, as I was listening to uh, Chris and his comments about agility, a lot of that resonates. There's this notion of it's, it's a systems uh, issue. And, and I'd say I spend as much of my time on the macro level as I do on the micro level, uh, trying to create change in the organization. Fantastic. So, you know, you mentioned the issue of transformation, right? And the challenges that, you know, people are facing. And I think there's that's embedded in what all three of you shared. Um, and certainly, I think the concept of inflection point, uh, I, I think that we're seeing truly, you know, the change in the new world of work, right? I mean, um, people are uh, moving to hybrid environments and so forth. And flexibility seems to be something that now has gone from a thing you had to do because of the pandemic to a thing that's preferred to do and, and people kind of want to stay there. Uh, but that sort of reflects also that people have sort of fundamentally changed and, and how they see things. And uh, so I'm, I, I know, you know, Microsoft has done a lot of work in this area and I'm wondering how you're seeing how people have changed and the work, you know, context has changed today coming up in your work that you're doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. And um, well, here's what we do know. As, as we've done multiple surveys across the entire organization, as people got used to, and, and I think now are getting good at working remotely, um, they have now said, I, I like this. In fact, based on our stats internal to Cisco, they have no desire to come back to the office and so the we, we have opened the offices and we are back, but we're, we've been very clear to say it's going to be a 3-2 schedule. Monday to Wednesday, you're in. Thursday, Friday, you're working from home, wherever that's appropriate and possible. Um, and it's been partly because we know we can run the business this way. Uh, and, and, we're, and we're also, I think, changing our point of view of you shouldn't be coming into the office to sit in your office all day in meetings, but instead, leverage coming together as a way for conversations to to action plan to be together as a team but have some real intention and purpose in being together and we're, we're figuring this out we don't have the answers but that's that's where we are today yeah yeah absolutely sally jessica 
Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to um, jump in there. Definitely, you know, flexibility and autonomy were key drivers of employee satisfaction before the pandemic. But if you look at kind of research by the Society for Human Resource Management, I think what happened is that the pandemic accelerated that and opened up business eyes because all of a sudden you could do remote work. People had never thought about it before, right? So people now know that it's an option. But I think kind of where I see flexibility in the world of work right now, a lot is in the strategy work I do with organizations and with leaders is really around the concept of emergent strategy, um, which is something, you know, outside the MSAD program, Adrienne Marie Brown is a um, great author on that one. Um, but also I think about like leadership in the new science by Margaret Wheatley um, and really that, you know, how you co-create reality and futures with people um, really builds on a lot of the work I do in that kind of intersection of social justice and organization development is like really co-creating new realities. And you can't always predict it. And I think that mindset, people are way more open to that mindset mm -hmm. right now than they were previously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jessica, what are you seeing? I think I'm seeing essentially three things happening simultaneously as it relates to talent. With leaders, I think people who don't have strong capabilities to be great leaders, they are being exposed. Um, and behaviorally, that's resulting in a lot of insecurity in how they're showing up. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to that, I'm also seeing leaders um, wanting quick fixes. So a lot of what we do in the HR space when we're trying to drive systems change, uh, it's methodical, it takes time if you want be sustainable, whereas the leaders have this feeling that they are drowning and gasping for air, and so they want a solution that can fix it fast, even, even though you tell them that it's not going to be sustainable, they still want it. So there's that layer there. And then the other layer of employees or the actual talent, um, it's almost like they've gone through an MSOD program and that they've, um, throughout the pandemic, have a new sense of awareness around what's important to them, what they're willing to stand for. I think that many employees just kind of subscribe to whatever the norm was and the pandemic gave people an opportunity to think and have a re uh, and essentially reset their own thought process around how they think about their career, their time and what they value. And all three of those things are rubbing up against each other right now. Yeah. 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 Let me follow up on that last thought that you just made there, Jessica. You know, I think the meaning of work is changing for a lot Absolutely. of people, right? And that's what part of the, the fundamental shift in people. It's um, kind of the, is it worth it equation? You know, is the, is the way this is, we're going about this and what's being expected of me, is, is it worth the time and energy? And connecting that to, to one of Michael's comments, I think also is this idea of, of what do we mean by flexibility, right? I might mean getting to work from home or getting to work in an office. Other people might not have that, that latitude in the work that they do. Um, right. And yet still other people might think it means I don't need to talk to you even on, on Zoom or whatever. I can just, you know, send my worksheet, you know, uh, after 10 o'clock at night when the kids are in bed. Um, you know, so this this is highly variable, and I'm wondering what you're seeing in the way of the impact on people, the stress or challenges people are experiencing uh, due to this variability. I, I, I was going to say, I think before we even touch that part, there is just only recently have I heard the this pop up in the conversation, but there's a general lack of acknowledgement that collectively we have gone through collective trauma. Mm -hmm. And so the baseline needs to be acknowledged that people generally are not okay. They're functional, they're showing up at work, but they're not okay. And then you add the fact that they are fatigued by change, depending on where you live in the country, um, between protests and fires and COVID, hybrid, not hybrid, people are beyond overwhelmed. I don't know that they have, not everyone has the word to say that. So instead what we're hearing over and over again is just burnout. So I think that's a piece of it. And so I think that once you acknowledge those things, then you can say, now how is it impacting individuals? And I think we are finding that 
people are struggling to find the words to articulate their state of being. Um, so there's that piece. I think people are unable to perform at the highest level that they used to be able to perform at because they're not okay and they're not getting the resources that they need to be okay. Uh, and there's just kind of this sense of, you know, companies have restructured and there are less people, but the amount of work has not been decreased. Uh, and so there, I would say the general sentiment is that people are overwhelmed, but still trying to push through, but you're starting to see people drop one by one because we're seeing people not just switch jobs and switch companies, we are seeing people leave the workforce completely, able-bodied individuals, not retirement age that are leaving. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 Michael. Yeah, just to jump in on that, I, I, Jessica, what Jessica just described, I'm seeing exactly the same thing in, in Cisco. And one, one intervention that, that we started now more than a year ago, that was just this little kernel of an idea has been really helpful for us. The notion was, let's just get small groups of people together for a brief conversation. We call it a real talk dialogue. And we give folks a tiny bit of structure, but it's basically to say, how are you doing? It's really a check-in. And, and we consciously said, it's not to do action planning. There shouldn't be something coming out where you have to, as a leader, go do something. But we did it to, to really see how folks were doing. And I, I just did one of these um, a week or so ago, and it was shortly after uh, a mass shooting event here in Texas. It was also just after Roe versus Wade decision. And I just opened the conversation by saying, how are you all doing? What's on your mind? And this was a group of maybe 15 of us uh, from my team across the world. And, and to hear this, what Jessica described, the weight on people's shoulders, the exhaustion they're feeling, and though not, not intended or planned this way, you could, you could see the a lightness start to occur after 45 minutes or so, just giving people the chance to talk and say what's on their mind and, and not have to sit with it in their heads is, is a really helpful, simple intervention. Yeah, absolutely. Sally, I'm going to come to you in just a second and ask mm -hmm. you about how social justice issues mm -hmm. have compounded. Mm -hmm. But specific to you, uh, Michael and Jessica, based on what you've been saying, um, the, the, the challenge I see in, in the research I think supports this is, is you know, people have increased time in meetings, a, a, a record 252%. The average workday has increased by, by something like 46 minutes. So if people were already working nine or 10 hours, now it's like 10, 11 hours and so forth. Um, People want that more flexibility, and yet 50% of leaders want people back in the office full time mm -hmm. with this idea of how to be responsive uh, to employees. And so we're seeing this, this huge mm -hmm. sort of uh, disengagement. How do you respond to those employees? Because the other thing that we're seeing in the research is that people are feeling all these things. They're willing mm -hmm. to talk about it but not where their leader or supervisor can discover that they're feeling that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how, how, how do you see, or how are you responding to uh, those kinds of dynamics, given that people don't want their bosses to know they're overwhelmed and burnt out, but that they <laughs> are. I, I wish there were a simple answer to that question. I, you know, we, we, I think the first step for us uh, in Cisco is, we're starting to talk about it at the at the senior most levels in the organization to sort of bring awareness about this issue. You know, if you, the higher the altitude that you are in the organization, sometimes the less information you get, or the less accurate, or the less uh, the real the information is. So, so we're trying to raise this issue of what what is the the real possible solutions, or frankly, what is it just what's going on today to get the facts and data about the numbers of meetings and so on. But then it's, so what can we do as we're trying to become more collaborative and as we're working with hybrid teams and we wanna create more change in the organization through transformation, how do you do all of that and reduce meetings and meeting time and so on? It's a, it's a conundrum. We're, we're trying some simple things like no meeting dates or weeks here and there. We're giving people flexibility about working times. 
but I, I can't say that we've found all the golden tickets of exactly how to, to make this better. We're experimenting. That's what I would say. I, I think we're doing the same thing um, that Michael described. I think a piece of it is listening to our caregivers or our employees. So mm -hmm. we have our annual survey to hear their voices, but we also have poll surveys quarterly to hear their voices. Mm -hmm. And then there are the comment sections. And uh, I would say in the last 18 months, I've watched our employees become more vocal, more explicit, and more direct in those comments. And so what I'm proud about at Providence is by July of 2020, the, the company had already established personas to figure out what is our hybrid future mm -hmm. look like. Um, so moving really quickly to say, we don't think this is going to be temporary. I think we have the benefit of being in healthcare to kind of see how long we were going to be in this journey. And then the other piece is kind of sensing what's happening in the environment. So we're watching people resign at a rapid rate mm -hmm. and that's this thing. And so while we have opened up our doors and people can come back to work, it has not been uh, with pressure of like, you have to return to work. It has been more of be there when the business needs you, unless you have a role where you need to be in the office and respond to that. So I think, you know, our point of view and the energy that we brought to hybrid work in November of 2020 shifted by July of 2021. And now that we're seeing, you know, the workforce crisis, we have we have adjusted our um, our tone, if you will, in relation to that. We're still holding the line because we need to be able to be agile and be able to pivot. And so we haven't completely become relaxed, but we have become much more flexible than I think we intended to be when this conversation started. Yeah, yeah I think you're both conveying what, what mm -hmm. many are experience, uh, experiencing, and that's that we're kind of building the bridge as we're walking on it towards this new world mm -hmm. of work. Mm -hmm. Sally, I want to turn to you and ask you a bit about how you're seeing the social justice uh, issue. Mm -hmm that have increased in uh, voice, if you will, um, compounding or, or intersecting with all of these dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. And like plus one to everything these two just said, I mean, absolutely seeing the same things. I think a couple of things uh, to kind of bring the social justice element into it is one is we're having conversations we've never had at work and requiring a level of vulnerability that we've not had at work whenever you're doing the social justice work, when you're doing, you know, having the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And unfortunately, um, when you're doing that work, harm's going to continue to happen, you know, because people are learning and mistakes are happening. So then it's like people have an awareness of it, right? And you're kind of on higher alert. Um, I'm seeing that play out a lot in teams um, because I feel like there's a level of like t people are so burned out and then like you get a group together and try to do a planning session or something like that. And it's funny, I've gotten like, it's happened to me enough now when I facilitate a session that I can actually see them. It's like they're driving a car and just run it into the ditch hmm. and they're like, okay, I'm done. Like I'm out, you know, this is, too, this is uncomfortable. This requires, mm -hmm. too much. and I see it more in my racial equity than in other people of it and I, I brought back actually a lot of stuff that Darren Good taught us and you know group behavior and group stuckness of having people get into the space to be able to step back and reflect on themselves um is really hard when people are dealing with the level of burnout um so I think that's why a lot of organizations are struggling with their DEI strategies obviously whenever they only do that through HR they don't have an understanding of it um you know, and um, also there's a lot of performative behavior that people are really clear um, and, you know, see it very clear for what it is. So um, it definitely adds a different mix of kind of what's happening in the world today. One more comment on this, and then I want to shift uh, direction a little bit. Uh, the, the sort of immediate polling research that's been out in the last week is that uh, uh, with the Supreme Court decision, um, regardless of where you land on the position of, of, of pro-life or pro-abortion or anti-abortion, is the issue uh, that it seemed to be predicated on this notion of right to privacy. Uh, and where that lays in, in, you know, is that at the federal level or is that at the state level? Mm -hmm. Regardless of the legal and technical arguments there, there's been some sort of instant polling that has been showing up 
again, sort of indicating that this is sort of adding another layer of distress amongst mm -hmm. workers who are mm -hmm. already feeling kind of burned out, especially mm -hmm. um, if they're part of a population that might have been marginalized. Again, mm -hmm. persons of color, women, mm -hmm. LGBTQ. Um, I, how, how or have you seen any of this begin to show up? Ooh, ooh, can I answer that? <laughs> Um, I will say, yeah, I mean, I've, I've really thought about a lot of this in the last week of like, you know, companies coming out and saying, I'll pay, you know, we'll pay for extra medical services. And even I, who don't even work for those companies, I'm like, well, that was kind of performative because why weren't you doing it before? Um, you know, or why don't you put that money toward raising everybody's pay? Um, you know, so there, it's all so complex because then you're thinking about are employees going to tell their employers of these needs and you know I kind of have my HR hat on with all that right um so it is like again this level of vulnerability and I feel like organizations can step in and say you know kind of to what Michael was talking about hey let's just have a space um to talk about this and somebody said in the chat too about like people train, you know, yes, absolutely. You need people trained to hold space for those conversations. And it's not always HR because yeah. um, people have hangups about HR. Okay. I'm going to step off my sofa. Okay. I think, I think because it's such a private and personal topic, I think the concern that companies should have is that their employees are not going to tell them what they're really thinking. And as a person who is a member of multiple marginalized communities, one, I will tell you, I think the studies show from Catalyst in, at the end of 2021 that less than 3% of Black or African Americans wanted to return to work because of the microaggressions that we experience when we show up. <laughs> and so m people in my network are actively trying to find roles that reduce the amount of time that they need to be in the office, or if they need to be in the office, then they are being very prescriptive about working at organizations that are not performative and that have reputations that other people can vouch for. I think the other piece is uh, specifically with the recent Supreme Court ruling, the conversations I am a part of for members who are part of marginalized communities are what countries we can live in. There is a very real conversation right now. There, there are numerous articles about particularly millennials who have left the country in the pandemic uh, Portugal has a ton of them right now, but I think the other piece is there's a really there's a very real conversation around what we are anticipating is also going to come, and how we don't want to be here for it, and our job is really the least of our concerns as a part of that process. And I think it's really difficult to solve for a problem that you're not aware of from a company's perspective, but I. I we have a serious issue on our hands in that you have multiple populations who no longer feel safe in this country in a way that they never felt unsafe before. Yeah. And, and here's, Gary, here's another layer on, on sort of plussing up Jessica, what you, you just said, what I uh, like it or not, I think more and more employees are, if we're losing confidence in the federal government, regardless of what your views are, they're expecting their companies are going to lean in and uh, companies who don't say something about a particular topic are going to be having t troubles, issues. And if you do weigh in, you could also have issues, concerns, uh, things going on. So what we're what we're trying to do is to say, take it back to, um, first of all, have a group and how do you have the right conversation with the right group and put in place some sort of guidelines and in our case, thinking about what's the purpose and the values of the organization so we can choose when to lean in, when not to lean in, and for what purpose. It's got to have something to do with our associates, but also with the company and for the right reasons. So we don't just, to Sally's point, it'd be very easy for companies to jump in uh, 24 hours after some event occurs, but it may not be the thoughtful or the correct thing, or it could be to Jessica's point, just a performative issue. So the thought is it needs to be a reasoned, thoughtful approach and companies have to lean into this. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to share, if you haven't noticed in the chat, you're, you're getting a lot of 
you know, woo woo, yay, yay, support. So I think you're, uh, all the comments you're making are really resonating with uh, folks who are on with us at this point. Um, so let me ask you this. You, you all went through the MSOD program and you're dealing with very complex circumstances. That's what's becoming very clear and evident across all three of you. And if we just sort of take you as a microcosm of OD practice and kinds of issues OD practitioners are dealing with, because it's not just about the social dynamics, it's about how that interfaces with, with businesses and businesses and organizations, not just you know, for-profit businesses, relying on talent to be able to achieve whatever the goals are of their organization. Um, what what in your OD training helped prepare you um, mm -hmm. to, to deal with some of the stuff that you're dealing with? What do you find yourself drawing on? For me, it's the tool of dialogue. Um, dialogue mm -hmm. um, the, that in connection with trusting my intuition, that has been a huge piece. So, uh, using questions to understand what's really happening because i think in many of our meetings we are hearing the presenting problem but our intuition is telling us something else is happening mm -hmm. and we're able to use dialogue to uncover what the real issues are and to be able to solve um you know when i think about our time in france and using the tools of even just scanning the physical environment and using those as clues to understand what is valued or what the priorities are of a particular organization between those two things, I can almost often get a snapshot of the culture before we really, really start to dig in. So I would say the dialogical change, it, it's been helpful with, um, when I think of appreciative inquiry and, and designing for the future, but then also the other conversations to start to unpack and understand what's happening within team dynamics. I think that have, for me has been the most powerful tool. All of the strategy stuff, it's been helpful, but I think to drive really meaningful change that's sustainable, it's been the dialogical piece. Okay, great. Michael, Sally? Yeah, the two, two things come to mind. There's a long list of things, but two things that I would share that come to mind are sort of different ends of the continuum. One is self as instrument, and, and some of what Jessica described is in there, but this notion of who am I and how do I show up in the world and how do I make sure that I understand my stuff not getting in the way of those that I'm working with. So that whole piece of the power of the self as instrument. And um, this notion of complexity that uh, is so, so important in the program because we are Complexity, and I'll say trans org work. Most of the work that we now need to do, it, it is it can't be done in an isolated way. It's across multiple organizations. Now that might be within multiple functions or geographies within a large company, but generally even that's not large enough. It takes multiple organizations outside of the organization as well as inside. You know, we're starting to really lean in on climate and sustainability issues because Cisco, Cisco is big enough to do that. But that is a clear, complex, trans-org set of work that needs to be done. So that, those are two things that come to mind for me. Great, great. Sally? Yeah, I definitely um, agree with what's been said. And I will say one thing I've noticed, um, actually a friend of mine that went through the MSOD program that I talked to today, we were kind of talking about how we feel like we have more emotional capacity right now because of the self as instrument work we did through MSOD, because so many people are feeling burned out and haven't, you know, had that like reflection loop that they need to, you know, kind of get into their lives and, you know, those practices. So um, I feel like that's such a gift in this space. And then um, also, yeah, definitely the complexity theory, chaos, um, the trans organizational work, I will say from a social justice standpoint, I feel like I'm pulling more into the trans org work as we build collectives and collaboratives um of networks to expand capacity around movement and around um even pay equity um and i'm it's i'm so grateful to have that framework um of how that kind of builds on relationship um and not just common purpose um you know this work uh as and it's certainly been indicated by what you guys have shared is is really challenging um but i think it's also really exciting right i mean we get to be in space in a space that um, maybe we're out to space, but no, we get to be in a space where 
were working intimately with some significant issues and, and so forth. Um, how and this concept of self as instrument, you're absolutely right, Michael. How, who are we and how do we show up? How, how did your MSOD training impact you personally? What's the personal impact of that? I think we all start with life changing, uh, as, as we talked about. Um, it personally, it has certainly impacted. I mean, I think about the work that I do now versus the work that I did prior to the program. And I'm a 2007 graduate. Uh, it, it's just night and day, but it is all uh, about recognizing and dealing with who I am. And before I can help any clients transform, before I can help Cisco transform, I got to figure out what's the work I've got to do to transform. What's the hard work? Uh, to, to make sure that I can be a, what we sometimes call a clean instrument with, with clients. So it, it, it has impacted how I show up with my kids. It has impacted uh, how I show up with my wife. I don't think I would be married today if I hadn't gone through this program. Uh, so it, it is a, and certainly I wouldn't be doing the roles and the work that I'm doing today without the personal work that this program has helped me go through. Great, Michael. Jessica? I can, I can go next. I can say that it was life-changing in so many ways. On a personal note, the program affirmed my unique gifts. Uh, it created a level of clarity that um, it's beyond self-awareness. When I say clarity, it means that I'm clear about who I am, and I'm even more clear about who I'm not. I'm comfortable telling people who I'm not. I no longer feel the need to pretend or posture that I'm great or okay at something that I know that I'm terrible at. So I think that's a huge piece. Uh, it, it helped me to be confident in any situation that I enter because I now have the tools to assess or impact that situation because of the program. And then it also gave me competency that um, one, the, the the reputation associated with the program is one piece of it, but the tools that are in my in my toolbox now, uh, I'm really unafraid of any situation that I move into. And then it has empowered me to show up as an instrument of change even more so. Um, two other MSOD alum, Mary Messer, myself, and Maxine Clark, uh, you know, in 2020, when we, you know, the racial uprisings were becoming more visible, I was having a conversation with Mary Messer and I was like, we need to do something where she was asking me, what could she do? And I was like, go do this thing, you're strategic. And what came from it was an allyship program. Mary uh, designed an allyship program and Maxine and I co-facilitated with her. And it was really, we felt like we can see an opportunity and we can help bring a solution to the table. We don't need to wait for our companies. We don't need to wait for our university. We have these tools and we can impact change. And from that, so much has blossomed. That allyship program has evolved and Mary is, uh, is now a full-fledged entrepreneur with that. Uh, but for the rest of us, it means that when we see needs, so for example, when um, the Asian hate last year was being elevated, uh, Cassie Roki from Buy Prime, myself and Mary Messer, we held a session to hold space for members of that community who had never articulated their feelings before, had never had a space to discuss their feelings before. So I think it's also empowerment of, I'm gonna go do something right now. It doesn't take six months. It doesn't take money. It doesn't take someone else. We're gonna use what we have and we're gonna start where we are right now. Love that, Jessica. Great. Sally. Yeah, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, um, I will say, you know, again, totally agree with um, Jessica around the clarity of self and kind of who I am and who I'm not. And, you know, having this space because, you know, when I was going through the program, of course, I'm working full time. I'm married. I have multiple kids. Uh, you know, I mean, like I have a lot of different roles in life. And so that was like a space where I could it was just kind of about me. Um, you know, and I think what I realized also through the program from kind of a personal standpoint is how few moments in my professional life where I truly had people give me good feedback um, and effective feedback in that like was something, you know, rather than that was great versus like, hey, that was great. And, you know, and so that was really powerful for me. And then I think the integration of the personal and the professional right is that you really are a whole human um 
and that you know your professional is not separate from personal and you know vice versa you don't show up to work as separate beings and so the integration we work we did throughout the program especially at the end was really powerful for me yeah fantastic you know i i, I love what each of you are sharing and i think the um the articulation you gave jessica to the idea that that you all have the tools i mean you, you, you know not just in terms of skill and knowledge, but in the kind of emotional wherewithal to say, hey, I have the agency to make a difference here. And then and, and to do that, the chat is sort of uh, popping out that a lot of people are just loving that and, and congratulating and, and supporting that. Um, I do wanna take a couple of questions potentially, if we could real quick. I know we're right almost out of time, but I noticed there was one earlier from Andy and he said he was asking about some of the complications uh, that we were talking about relative to work or whether or not we're seeing any differences by age groups, like younger persons wanting to work in an office, older people happy to be at their home or whatever. So I don't know if anyone cares to make a comment relative to Andy's question. I, I will say we are seeing somewhat of a difference. Uh, millennials and Gen Z, Gen Z in particular, are being more vocal about wanting to work remotely. Um, and those coming into the organization uh, through the recruiting process are also very clear and saying, I want flexibility to work remotely. What are your practices and policies? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Are there any other questions out there that somebody would like to ask of the panelists? We, we can maybe take one or two more. Gary, while you wait for a question to come through, I just would be remiss to not acknowledge that one of the critical benefits of the program is the community that we get as a part of it. Uh, many of us still are in touch with either members of our cohort Many of us are in business with members um, from our cohorts. Um, you know, I feel like I can reach out to Gary or even Dr. Darren Good whenever I like. Um, Gary received many messages from me during the pandemic of like, Gary, this is the thing that I'm seeing. I think you need to go talk about it. <laughs> um, and so just having this community, not only of thought partners, but of friends who feel like family uh, and individuals who you speak a common language with um, because most of us go through the pro program and our loved one just kind of look at us like, I don't know what has happened to you. <laughs> um, and so uh, the community is um, truly priceless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, around hybrid meetings, do, do people have any suggestions? That was one thing that popped up. I, I, yeah, I'm happy to pop up. You know, hybrid meetings, what I find is like when I'm, I do more facilitating retreats than necessarily like regular hybrid meetings, is I find that the virtual participants are higher performers and functioning than the in person. <laughs> I don't know what it is of like, you know, just like of like, you know, it's clear and you're, you know, you kind of have a breakout room you go into and you, you know, whatever versus the group when person can get derailed. So I think um, it's definitely, um, you know, it's, there's a lot to manage there, but I also think that, you know, I always lead with connection before content and sure. like this, if we're meeting, it needs to be about connection. And if there's some kind of content, you should have read it beforehand. Um, and let's do that asynchronously unless we're having a decision or something like that. So um, I think virtual and hybrid has really lifted up the importance of good facilitation skills. Wow, great, great point. Um, this one might be, uh, uh, um, well, I'll let you guys decide, but one of the questions from Lori is how, how do you encourage employees to be more vulnerable? with all that they might be feeling and what's going on with them. Any thoughts around that? I think for me, a huge part of it is modeling the behavior. Uh, I find that I lead with modeling the behavior. People just kind of look at me like this. And then one day when I'm in a one-on-one -on -one setting, it's reciprocated back. And so I think modeling to showcase what it could look like to showcase that it is safe to do it. And then when someone tries to do it, making sure that they have an experience 
um, that leads them to want to do it again. Meaning don't have strong negative reactions. If someone else does handle it in the room, but I would say leading with modeling the behavior because I think actually think that's the hardest part. Great, Michael? Yeah, I, I saw, ditto to that one. And a simple thing, this was from a group of psychologists who put together a package of helping folks. And it was uh, ask the simple, how are you doing? But ask it twice. Ask it once and then folks will say, I'm fine. And we all know what that means, freaked out, insecure, neurotic, uh, emotional. But then ask it a second time and really give people a chance to answer. Great. Love that. Well, thank you all. I, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to glance at any of these uh, chats here, but, um, uh, you know, people are just saying really wonderful things and what's meaningful of what you guys have been saying. Uh, Terry Van Quickenborn's talked about the generative power of OD. Uh, Stephen Pyle is uh, saying this community is truly priceless. Um, and I just want to say, I just love you guys. I know I'm a professor and I know I'm not supposed to say that stuff, but I just really love you guys. You responded so quickly when I put out the call and uh, so selflessly have been willing to be here this evening and share. Um, it, it really has been a tremendous gift and uh, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Yes. Here, you do know we recorded this session, right? So they have a recording to keep forever. <laughs> ah, great. Well, I think they knew I loved them anyway. But, and that goes for all of you on the chat who are MSOD alums. Love that you're here and love the support that's coming through. Uh, Tiffany, I'll turn it back over to you. I want to be respectful of people's time. So I'll let no you problem. close this. No problem. Thank you so much, Gary. Sally, Jessica, Michael, just all the inspiration is just coming through the chat, all of your energy. Um, you are re-energizing all of us to go back out and do our work and also, you know, re-energize ourselves this 4th of July weekend. So thank you to all uh, who joined us today. I'm excited to have you here, our faculty, our alumni. Thank you for coming out um, and putting on today's event of discovering impact in the world of work. Uh, for those of you who are new to OD, please feel free to connect with us. We'd love to welcome you into this beautiful, life-changing world. <laughs> and with that, um, we'll close out tonight's event. And we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. all. Bye.